Good morning, everyone. This is John Elway on Student Services, and this morning we will be um, we have three presenters. They are going to present on the Texas Pathway. The pillars three and four. Our presenters are Dean Julie Starkey, Associate Dean Eva Hutchins, and Alan Falkenstein. Uh, and our web they are actually combining pillar four with pillar three. So the webex that is scheduled for March third will be will not occur. Okay, I just want to let you know that, and then I'll let, uh, and we will start in about five minutes, seven thirty-five. Oh, are we ready? We're live. Uh, Ellen, are you on? Ready? Yes. Why don't you start? So today we're here to talk about pillars three and four from the Texas Guided Pathways. I'm Ellen Falcon. I'm the program coordinator for Math Express. I'm here with Dean Starkey and Dean Hutch. Next. <laughs> Ellen, we're having a little connection issue. We've got some static. Uh-oh. You want to start over? Well, keep, no, let's keep going. Let's keep going. Hopefully, it, won't, it could be weather-related, too. Bear with us, okay. everyone. We'll go to the next slide. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. All right. So just a reminder about tech guided pathways. Uh, the pathways start in middle school. We help students find that path and get going. Goes through high school, college, and on to a career. And the whole point is getting to pursue their goals and dreams. All right, next. <laughs> Last WebEx, we talked about pillars one and two, where we clarify the path to student end goals, help students enter a pathway. This time we're going to come to students and ensure that students are learning. Next. And so, first, the number three, Eva. All right, so um, good morning, everybody. This is Eva Hutchins. I just, part of the process for staying on the path, there's, there's several components that go into this. Uh, some of the things I'm going to talk about are some of the legislation that dictates, um, you know, what colleges are supposed to do here in the state. So Senate Bill 25 and 1324 address our dual credit students and making sure that they're on a path to transfer once they're out of high school, um, just depending on what they do in high school, we have students who are in dual credit, STEM, early college high school, where they earn a degree um, at the two-year level. So just depending on what their goals and plans are, this is just to make sure that we're talking to students at certain points throughout their path, making sure that they know what they want to do and that they're taking courses towards that goal whenever they do transfer. Um, another House bill was 3808, which does refer to students um, at the college level who are taking our interdisciplinary studies program. Uh, since that is a general degree, it allows you to complete the core, and then um, there's 18 hours of elective. Um, the legislation uh, here just speaks to making sure that we're working with students to make sure they're focusing those electives on um, specific goals at the four-year level. So if they plan to transfer into a certain area, making sure they're, they're taking courses that will lead them toward that. Um, advising, of course, plays a large role into these outcomes. And of course, public aid education does as well in referring to dual credit students, but all of us can touch these students and work with them at any point. Um, student services staff, uh, faculty, all, all of these areas will, will work with this and ensuring that we're wrapping around that student and getting them ready to go. Some other initiatives throughout student services is um, our auto grad process, which uh, really speaks to supporting Texas's 60 by 30 goal. So this allows um, student services in the graduation area to report degrees, um, whether the student applies for them or not. So this is something that, that can help support that goal because there's a lot of times, especially in our AAS programs, where students um, don't apply for the certificate along the way and they do pick that up um, into the program that's associated with their AAS. And that's a way for us to, to go ahead and get those numbers going and support that 60% um, of Texas with a degree by 2030. Um, we also use uh, risk scores, which is developed through our student success teams, which much more will be on that at our 3-3 meeting, which some of you may be invited to. 
um, that are listening in, and Julie will speak to that as well here in a few moments. But um, this just helps us kind of work with our students and, and know what's going on in their lives through through uh, a very targeted approach. Um, some other areas um, that faculty, CTC staff, especially advising, that throughout student services and student support, um, as well as students themselves can use is the self-service um, feature in WebAdvisor to track and monitor their degree progress. So this is a wonderful tool developed out of uh, Dean Walsh uh, alongside Georgia Carkey. Without them, this would not be possible because they build all the background and it's a large, uh, large work um, to make sure those degree programs are built every year um, as degree programs change and, and uh, courses within the core change. So those are all um, uploaded through that, through that area into the, our student information system, which speaks directly into their, um, into their self-serve area of my progress. Um, so I'll go ahead and show the next couple of slides. These are just some areas. This is a faculty view of self-service, as well as a student view on the next slide. And so this just shows you just kind of, you know, you may be familiar with this, but just to kind of give you a glance of what it looks like um, at both levels of the view. So those are just wonderful areas where we can go and we can see where they're at and we can make sure that we're giving them correct information to stay on that path. And um, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Julie Sorkin now, who's going to speak to you on her area. Good morning, everybody. I'm going to talk to you about first about our student success teams, then I'm going to talk about some resources that we have to support our students. Um, our student success team initiative is a way we here at CTC are trying to organize our students success initiatives, and we're trying to leverage relationships students have with uh, faculty and staff that matter to them. Um, what we tell students is, did you know you have a team that is here to individually support you? You have up to five team members based on your circumstance. Um, the first member of the team, obviously, is their academic advisor. This is an important relationship that we want to have developed. Second is their academic department, so wherever their degree or certificate lies, they're linked to that department. SSP, which is the Student Success and Persistence Area, our area is really, we coordinate a lot of the resources for students. And then the final two areas that can, could be a member of the team is going to be dependent on that student status. If they are dual or uh, early college high school or STEM, they're going to be assigned to the public education area. And if they are not TSI complete, they're going to be assigned to the developmental studies area. Now, those aren't the only members of the, the team that matter, obviously. For us to be successful and for us to touch all the students that we need to touch, we have to have relationships with other supports that are going to contribute to these teams and to those students. The other people are going to be people like financial aid, veterans affairs, career center, disability. All of these areas are critical uh, to the team and our initiatives. We're going to go into a lot more detail about the Student Success Team Initiative and how that how that works on our meeting on 3-3, which is the Student Success Team kickoff. You should have received an invitation yesterday, or many of you. Um, so you're going to get more information there uh, about this initiative. So let's go to the next. The next things that I want to talk about are some very specific tools that we have in place for anybody that they can use. What I'm showing you here is our referral system. This is a form that is available to any faculty and staff member. The idea behind the referral system is to cut out unnecessary referrals, where we send people from office to office, or we, we transfer them from phone to phone. And you don't have to use this. You can send it by email. You can just pick up the phone and call. But what we're trying to do is prevent just answering a simple question from a, that a student's asking and not getting at the root of everything. This form is available um, under uh, the faculty staff area under form, and you can see where you can send it. And it puts the onus on the area who is receiving the referral form uh, to respond back. Uh, once you select an area, you can also put your comments so that you are communicating to that area as opposed to you telling the student to go over to that area if you want to make sure they get clear information. So this is just one tool potentially you can use. Again, we're going to go more into referrals at the 3-3 meeting. The next is our retention alerts, formerly known as um, early alerts. This is mostly used by our faculty, but it is available for our success team to be able to see what's going on with the student. Again, you get to this from the faculty staff area under form. Um, and if you go to the next slide, this is what one looks like. You can see kind of the things that we track. 
on students. These can be filled out at any time that a faculty member feels that they are concerned about a student. We nudge them twice during every semester to complete this information. The student gets a copy of the alert. Uh, the alert goes to the person who submitted the alert, and then it comes to the academic studio, and we do some follow-up with the students as well. But the, uh, this is another tool that people that are working with students can look at to see what's going on with the student. Uh, the last thing that I want to mention is our risk score. This is developed through Target X. Um, what we have done is we've developed a way to look at students across three, mo uh, 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 across three modules, academic engagement and financial. We've developed some algorithms, and it lets us know how the students are doing in these areas. Academic is based on the GPA and the uh, retention alert. Engagement is based on how many holes they have that are restricting um, their enrollment, um, because that is obviously a barrier. And then the financial is based on their financial aid status, as well as if they have a balance with the, with the business office that they have to pay off. Um, and so you can look at these scores um, individually on a staff, on a student to see what's going on, but also it can be run as a report. So let's say we need to run a report on the students that are on academic probation, but you also want to add these scores to the report to kind of get a bigger picture of what's going on with them, that can happen. So why don't you go to the next slide. This is what it looks like in TargetX. If you're looking at an individual student, you can see what it's gonna show. But again, you don't have to have access to TargetX necessarily because it can be run as a report. You can re request a report with this information and it kind of gives you a more complete picture or a bet more information to talk with the student about. You can go to the next one. The last thing that I'm going to talk about is um, some of the tutoring options that we have available for students. I think most students, most of you think of the academic studio, which is great. I appreciate that. Uh, we do tutoring across the subject areas, content areas, we do face to face and online. But look at how many options that we have throughout campus. We are a campus that has a plethora of tutoring and support options available for students in the math area in the um, computer area. I want to mention the, the Learning Resource Center for our industrial tech and office technology students. The library, I think people oftentimes forget, they are the experts on paper revisions and citations, and really we need to refer uh, students to that area. Last thing to mention is a new class that we're offering, our Education 1100 Learning Framework. Uh, that students oftentimes take early in their career first semester. It's a one credit hour class offered online. It really teaches students what they're learning, how they learn, um, how to be successful as a student, um, and it is another way where we are giving students uh, resources and other information that's important. This is just a flyer about the academic studio. We're going to move on, and I'm going to turn it over to Ellen, who's going to talk more about how we support students. Thank you, Julie. One thing I don't think very many people know is Paul, the science department, started an initiative where they have assistance. And so the um, science associates are in the classroom. They also run a tutoring lab. They run Saturday and evening lab just to help the students be successful in the science area. And then nursing runs um, a simulation lab, and they have an open skills lab. Um, this is not everything that we are doing, of course, across campus. Uh, but it just gives you an idea. Then we, we will move on to ensuring that we have lots of options for students. Uh, what, we, of course, have our evening and weekend program. Uh, we are expanding our military transition program. We, almost every department has eight-week courses, but business has actually gone to all eight weeks. Um, and we've mentioned we look at it early college high school STEM, and those are expanding as well. And then also in the service areas, we're starting to have more programs, especially in the allied health area. Uh, another big thing is the competency-based, competency-based, excuse me, education. Uh, this is where a student gets credit for what they already know. So they go into a course. It's not really self-paced. Uh, the teacher is usually right there, or if it's online, they're nudging them. But the student is working at their pace. They're rewarded. They take a diagnostic usually in the beginning of the class to see where they are. So Kate and the office technology uh, do, I believe, all competency-based industrial tech as well. 
We have it in child development, business management, drafting, and design. And I don't think very many people know, but in math, we also have the competency base so that you can get through the pre-calc and the calculus track. Because it takes two years to get through all of that before you can even get to engineering. So this is a way to get uh, students through faster than they can be done to their engineering. We also have related courses. On Fort Hood, they teach history with British literature. Um, and then, of course, our co-requisites. So CT, uh, not CTD, Texas has some House Bill 2223, and that is a law telling us that we have to go to COREX. We've got to get students through developmental faster. And so right now we have to have 50% of the developmental students in a COREX. By fall, we'll be 75%. So for integrated reading and writing, we have this co-requisite course with the first level of English, so English 1301. This semester, we're doing a pilot with History 1302, and Nellie Fairfield, who runs the Developmental Reading and Writing, plans to increase that, hopefully maybe with a humanities course. And of course, math. Um, for eight years, we've been doing college algebra with developmental in a co-rec. Uh, the state recently had us lower our cut scores, so that's been a little fun. But we also now have contemporary math with developmental and statistics with developmental. The contemporary and statistics, you actually can go in with no prereq. Another big initiative in Texas is to make sure students are taking the right math. Not every student needs to take college algebra. So Debbie Prescott, the math department chair, worked with all the other department chairs to make sure that students were taking the right math class for their degree and program. The universities have also adjusted to this. So they're aligned to be able to study to industry standards and what's appropriate for that degree or certificate. We do always remind the students though to double check if they're planning on transferring to a university, make sure they are taking the right math. So on the next page, you'll see where we went through and we also tried to not give them so many choices. Uh, at one point, we had that to take a choice of three or four classes, and that was very confusing. So a lot of the departments went to just one. Um, business and statistics, I actually went to STEM college algebra, and the nurses were really trying to push to do statistics because the majority of the universities in Texas uh, want statistics for bachelors, not college algebra. All right, pillar four, ensuring that students are learning. So this is the fun one. Uh, the department chairs and the program coordinators all work very closely with the universities and industry to make sure that their program learning outcomes and their course learning outcomes are going to work for students to be successful. So we work with the universities and make sure that our students are headed to the university with all of the skills that they need. The, uh, we also meet with industry to make sure that not only the academic and technical skills are there, but also, of course, what we call the soft skills or the marketing skills. And our industry advisory boards give us lots of information for that, which is very helpful adjusting the program. They all use test stream software so that they can track it. Uh, they also can keep uh, uh, keep their data in one place, and of course, analyze it and revise. The next slide, and this is gorgeous, isn't it? This is a learning outcome for the engineering program. I know it's very busy, but I just wanted to show you that they lay out all of the learning outcomes on the left-hand side, and then they show in what classes they either first learn it, or it's reinforced where they learn to analyze the material. And all of the departments do this kind of thing. On the next slide, you'll see, um, oh, I showed that uh, Ronnie was really pushing to get more people into his automotive advisory committee. He had a huge group show up. Um, this is so important because it works both ways. We're learning from them of what our students need to have, but also they get to see what our students are doing and hopefully hire our students. 
Now, along with the program learning outcomes, which is a handful all to itself, the IE and IR departments also works very closely with all of the department chairs and program coordinators to make sure that all of these are aligned for student success. We have the curriculum review committee and our new paper team, which is core assessment and program evaluation review. Uh, that their goal is to make sure that we are consistent across programs. It gets very difficult when each program is doing its own thing, and we want to make sure that we can report up to the state and to SAC COC what we're doing with learning outcomes to show that we're collecting the data, we're evaluating, and making changes. All right, on the next slide, um, I'm going to show some of the information that I received last spring. This, of course, is not everything, and if you know of more, please let me know. When we were applying to move up on the cadre, I asked for information. So this is just part of what we do across campus. It's very important that students can demonstrate their knowledge and skills, but also show a university or a um, job that they're interviewing for, show what they've done. So these are all service learning kind of items. There's uh, projects, homeland security, botany, logistics. Again, it's only a handful. Um, those are projects, either a final project for a program or in class. Then we have projects outside of class. We have product, drama productions. Uh, we see our music students all the time, which is awesome. Uh, the patio cafe, the sweet cafe, aviation team, speech team. And then our clubs, I know I'm missing a bunch there, but uh, we have Net Impact, Student Government, Rossi, Rotorac. And this is just some of our Facebook page. Um, we are always, almost every day, something is posted on Facebook about something going on. We also have um, clinical placements, especially in outside health, that we have practicums and mental health, field experience and child development. Uh, CTC also partners with Fort Hood for an internship placement program. And these are great because they can lead into a job. And then for the on the next slide, we'll show all of our, oops, there we go, internships. Um, not all, I take that back. I'm sure I'm missing some, um, but these are some of the internships that we have. On the next slide, we're showing more of documented learning. So working on a portfolio that a student can take, they can either share if they're applying to a university, they can take with them to a job interview. Um, again, I'm probably missing some, but this is a really great way for students to show exactly what they've learned in our, their program at CTC. Okay. And there's our contact information. Again, please let me know if you know of uh, other things that I need to include with all of that, because I'm sure Pathways is going to ask what we're doing um, when we go to the conference here soon. I guess now we're ready for questions. You can, um, yeah. if you just put that in the chat box for us. Please feel free to, um, you can ask a question. I've unmuted everyone, or you can chat in your question. Does that, no one has any questions? We can't get too much information. <laughs> We're still okay. We appreciate everyone joining us this morning. Try to stay dry. Yeah. See you all at the 3-3 meeting.